Good morning chaps. We seem to have a break in the weather today and that is going to give us a little bit of time to really start to think about this plum tree that I've discussed a couple of times on the vlog already. So this tree was purchased whew, five or six years ago as an already fruiting mature tree and uh, we brought it home and planted it in the garden where it is now and for the past couple of years we haven't really had any fruit off of it because it was attacked early in the year by green fly and black fly so it dropped its leaves but this year uh, we made a conceited effort to try and prevent that happening and this is the fruits of our labor as you can see she's bearing fruit somewhat heavily i've seen heavier fruit laden trees to be fair but uh, she ain't doing bad considering she's had a few years off so the plan is to make a plum porter i think that'll be a good move i mean look at all these beauties here slightly backlit i think so you can't really see them and uh, They've got a bit of a yeast bloom on them and one or two have uh, been pulled off by me just to get them away from the good plums because they've had uh, a little bit of mould on them or something like that. This is a prime example. You see all the, the natural yeast on that. We don't want that near the other plums because it'll just set off like a chain reaction. But uh, yeah, the plan is to turn this into a plum porter or plum stout sometime this year. There's another rotten one. I can see several actually. So if I can just get up here and pull these off. Oh yeah, my thumb's just gone straight through that. There we go, oh, juicy thumb. Anyway, let's go indoors and talk about what exactly we plan to do with these wonderful fruits so I think what would be a good starting point is to actually inspect one of the plums so I've just taken this off the tree it's nice and shiny and uh, I've given it a rinse under the water and it's got that, that yeast bloom has been removed so let's pop it down on the chopping board here and I think we'll slice it around the equator and give it a twist and just have a look exactly what we're going to be working with look at that so that is a nice juicy bug free plum lots of flesh there I think it's only right for me to taste a bit while I'm here so the plan with this, of course, is to make a porter. Oh, that is sweet. That is not sour at all. So yeah, the plan is to make a porter with these. So what I want to do is today put together a base recipe for a porter and then we'll brew that on the pilot kit and uh, add the plums into secondary so we're going to split the batch and we'll take a little bit off and uh, try that just as a porter in its raw form and we'll also take part of that wort and stick it onto maybe three kilograms of plums for every 20 litres or so and we'll see exactly how that comes out this has made me salivate big time so uh, we're going to put together the recipe today and then what I want to do with the plums over the next week or so is start to gradually pick them off the tree when they all become ripe and then I'm going to stone them and then we're going to put them in the freezer and hopefully the freezer will break down the cell walls allowing the juice to escape and inhibit all of the microorganisms that are um, present on the skin and then we're not going to boil it or anything, we're just going to take it straight out of the freezer and we're going to add it to the finished fermented beer 
relying on the alcohol content to prevent any further, and the pH of course, to prevent any, any further spoiling with any yeast that are present on here. I'm sure we will get a little bit of secondary fermentation at some point, but why not making a lot of this beer and at the brew shed, I'm pretty sure it will be gone in a flash, provided it's tasty of course. Mm. So, let's get in the car, drive down to the brewery and put together a recipe for Prum Porter. Here we are, here is the kit and yesterday um, I was unable to get the camera out but we managed to put together this. So we've got the cooling system tapped into in this corner here and then we've slung these looms if you like each with their own sensing temperature probe and connectors to go onto the fermenters. Fantastic. So uh, we can now actually start to use the pilot kit and we've got somewhere to ferment which is ideal if we're going to be making a plum porter. So let's go upstairs, pull out um, Beersmith and also I think we may take a reference book or two just to make sure that we're doing the correct thing and we'll put together a beer recipe today. So I've been sat up here for a bloody long time. Look at the time of that now. And we're starting to piece together what would appear to be, um, well, some type of recipe. But what I've actually done is spend most of my time on the water profile, believe it or not, because I wanted to enhance the multi uh, side. Well, let's have a look at these notes and I'll explain it to you. So I started by doing some research in the books and all over the internet and I came up with a few paragraphs that I put together in the notes. So the plums are to be washed, stoned and cut into at least quarters and then the flesh is to be frozen for a week or so before using an aid to break down the cell walls. The fructose from the fruit we're expecting to dry the beer to some extent so an adjustment to the mash temperature and final attenuation to compensate for this is something we're going to have to consider possibly between 0 0.004 and 8 SG points higher on the final gravity that's what we're going to be looking for and then increasing the chloride ratio may help with the perceived smoothness and the body of the beer. So these are all points that I've sort of grabbed together just by looking uh, at this fruit beer section in Designing Great Beers book. Um, there's nothing in here about plum but I'm going to punt plum in as a mild fruit. So uh, I think we're going to need quite a bit of it and then because there's going to be sugars in there that will ferment out when we add it into secondary it'll dry the beer a bit so we want to end up with we don't want a dry sour beer we want a smooth plummy full bodied beer so we have to take that into consideration before we progress into finalizing mash temperatures and what grains we're going to put in there and then uh, an IBU to SG ratio uh, of around 0.5 is a good starting point for the hops so we're on the multi side we want to stay on the multi side with all of this and then the plum is allowed to be thawed and then added at terminal gravity to allow the pH and the alcohol to prevent the activity of any spoilage organisms from the fruit and then if all else fails and we end up with a plum porter that doesn't taste of plum then we will be adding some plum flavour which is an essence from Uncle Roy's Natural Flavours and this has been used on a few other recipes that I've been looking at uh, all over Jim's beer kit and whatnot and quite frankly all of this here it is look this is the Uncle Roy's plum essence 
Okay. Maybe not. That's I bought it. 28 quid. I've spent on plum essence, folks. There we are. 250ml of Uncle Roy's natural plum essence. So if all else fails, we'll add a few drops of that. But I want to make sure that the beer is nicely rounded and it has a nice multi character to it with a plummy undertone. We don't want to have a dry and grainy tasting stout. We want a sweet stout. So coming back to the recipe, I think what I really need to do is uh, maybe go and try something that I can lay my hands on locally like Titanic's Plum Porter and uh, and go over it like that and then move forwards with the recipe development. So I'm going to nip out and we'll go and get a bottle of porter and then talk about the recipe some more. So a quick trip out to the local supermarket unveils, unveils these treasures. We have here the Titanic Plum Porter, well known around town, you may say. This is a fabulous beer. Supreme Champion, I believe. Uh, last year's Camera Awards, I think. Or at least Best in Show. Might have been a Vanilla Porter that got Supreme Champion. And St. Peter's do one as well. Plum Porter. Sweet Porter with jammy damson and black currant. I've not seen this one before and I've not tried it so this will be an intriguing uh, delve into exactly what is in these beers and what they taste like. So I've had the plum porter before of course, 4.9%. Anyway, let's get these cracked open and do a bit of a side by side comparison and see if we can take anything uh, productive from the experience to help us develop the plum porter that we're going to be making next week. So I didn't really anticipate this becoming a beer review, but nonetheless, that looks like it's gonna happen while we uh, explore these beers. So the malts are Maris Otter, Pearl, Wheat Malt and Dark Crystal with Pilgrim Hops, Hercules, Goldins and Celia. Um, and it says natural plum flavorings and yeast so it doesn't appear there are any plums in there just the flavorings and then in the St. Peter's version I really do love their bottles you know then we've got uh, water, barley, wheat, hops, yeast and again there doesn't seem to be any <laughs> mention of plums in here or indeed black currants so the plum in flavor and aroma though maybe it's just uh, being added as a as an extract later on so let's get into these two beers and see what we think so I've kind of set the scene here a little bit and at the same time unfortunately you might be able to hear the rain, it's just started, and of course we've got a asbestos roof. So first things first, let's crack into this 4.9% Titanic Plum Porter and get it, into, get it into a glass. There's the money shot, folks. Right, well I can see straight away that it isn't completely opaque. And... Uh, it's more of a dark brown than anything else. And looking at that head, it's definitely got some roasty colors in there. Right, next is of course the St. Peter's Plum Porter. And let's get this poured out for comparison. Again, it looks kind of similar going into the glass. We don't have as much foam so I'm guessing this is a little lighter on the carbonation front but wow I can actually smell blackberries in that or blackcurrant just a little bit left in the bottle there 
Right, so let's go in for the plum porter first and we're gonna have a taste. We'll have a taste of this bad boy and a sniff on the aroma. So on the nose, it definitely smells fantastic. You can really pick up the hints of plum in there. It smells very, very fruity indeed. So we'll just try and get that camera to fix there. Right, let's go and have a taste then, folks. Mmm. Right, so, there's a little hint of sourness in there. There doesn't seem to be any roast flavours. If they are, they're well, well masked. And there's a little bit of sharp acidity on the back end, slightly acrid, in a good way. Uh, stringent maybe would have been a better word and uh, yeah I can definitely definitely taste the plum essence in there it's relatively dry but I think that's deceiving I think it's the plum that's giving it that impression the sourness that's giving it that impression that it's dry when in actual fact there is quite a bit of body behind the beer. You know what, we could test the ABV, uh, the final gravity should I say, and we might just do that. Right, secondly, we're gonna go in for the St. Peter's and we can see that the head has dissipated pretty rapidly on both of these beers. The aroma on this one is definitely more blackcurrant than it is plum. So let's go in for a taste. Mmm. Yeah, slightly more artificial on that one, and maybe a bit sweeter, but not at all unpleasant. In fact, both of those beers are extremely sessionable. Right, let's take it one stage further. Let's take some gravity readings on these two beers and see what they actually finished out at. So first off, we're going to take a couple of jugs and we're going to take the St. Peter's first and we have to knock the gas out of the beer which unfortunately means basically destroying it by passing it backwards and forwards between the two jugs otherwise we will get an erroneous reading and we don't want that so we're just knocking all the CO2 out of this beer so we can get down to the nitty gritty and it looks like that's going to take a while to settle out. So to remind us which one it is, we'll pop the bottle next to it. We'll grab a couple more jugs. Good job there, polycarbonate. And uh, we'll get straight on with the Titanic beer. And we'll do exactly the same to this. Oh God, the aroma on that is intense. It really is nice. Okay, so here we have a trial jar and we're going to be taking this Stevenson Reeve hydrometer. That's the company that you can order these from if you want one. So as I was saying before the camera went, this Stevenson Reeve hydrometer is really essential for uh, brewing commercially. In fact, it's a requirement by HMRC and the graduations on this are humongous. So we go from 10.30 here at the base of the stem up to zero over what is probably a six to eight inch length there, or as I like to tell Gemma, a good 10 and a half. And the good thing about this is because these graduations are so far apart, you can get really accurate uh, gravity information. So 10.10, 10, 10, 5, 10, 11, you know, and as it goes down, we can really get into the nitty gritty of these uh, beers so we can submit our duty returns accurately. And you never handle these with the stem either. They are extremely fragile. So coming back to, in fact, I'll zoom in a little bit for this. Coming back to the trial jar, we seem to have lost quite a lot of the head 
now from this particular sample and I don't actually think we've got enough beer to float the hydrometer so if that's the case we may have to crack another bottle open so we'll just drop that in see where we go so let's have a look at that final gravity I don't know if you guys can really see it from the position you're in uh, because it really is quite difficult to focus down on but I'm getting a reading there of about 10 11 so we'll jot that down the St Peter's is 1.011 approximately and then we'll save that beer because mama didn't raise no fool and then next we're going to go ahead and add in the plum porter from Titanic and I think that there is enough for us to sample there beautiful so let's have a look I'm as intrigued as you are folks as to what gravity this is going to finish out at and it looks like it's a little bit higher than the previous beer which is surprising actually because I thought that the St. Peter's was a little bit sweeter so we're about 10, 12 and a half there so let's just write that down 1.0125 now we've got that information we can continue with the rest of the test so it turns out then that the plum porter does actually have a higher finishing gravity than the St. Peter's and now I've done that test both of those beers taste completely different because they are somewhat oxidized it's tradition god I ate my job anyway I need to mull over those results and we'll come back to the recipe when I've eaten these pork scratchings it's a nice lie so after much deliberation and uh, pork scratchings I've finally settled on a recipe so let's zoom in and have a look and uh, I'll pop this up on the internet and we'll get a little bit of feedback from it from you chaps out there in the comments below hopefully and uh, I'll also give you the reasonings behind why I've chosen certain ingredients and uh, certain points in time to add them due to the quirks if you like in Beersmith right I hope most of this is visible to you guys out there I'm sure it will be uh, but for those who can't see it, I will share the Beersmith file over the cloud so if you search for Harry Brew 69 I think I am on here uh, then Harry Brew 69 then you should be able to find me and I'll set this to share live for you guys to have a look at so plump water water we've got some water in here and that includes uh, some calcium chloride some gypsum in order for us to get the correct chloride sulfate ratio you can have a little peek at the water if you are so interested and of course these are the numbers and this is the base water profile so the adjusted water profiles are down at the bottom there if you can see that you can pause and have a look but that's what we've gone with it's a brand new water profile for me so again I'm flying in the blind with this one uh, the grain bill consists of pale malt for the base and then we've gone for 5.7% of the grain bill to uh, consist of wheat malt for head retention and then 4.5% of the grain bill for crystal 400 or dark crystal from mountains and then the plum itself is actually taking up what's considered 37.5% of the grain bill 
because that goes in as a fermentable. Now I'm going to let this primary ferment and then put the plum in to secondary but if I put it in secondary in Beersmith unfortunately it doesn't take into account the sugars that we're adding and the ABV does not change and this amount of plum should give us at least 1% uh, extra alcohol in the beer so because we are going to be selling it I want to make sure that we're doing it correctly in regards to HMRC making sure I'm not making alcohol which I'm not declaring now I do have some Atanum hops which I was going to use for this recipe but they're from 2014 they're still vac backed but uh, I really don't know what the alpha acids are going to be like in them because it's only 3.7 alpha to start with and after the hop storage index adjustment it comes out at less than 1% alpha so it would have meant putting 500 grams of that hop in and it's still a bit of an unknown so I've just bought some Goldings brand spanking new fresh crop from Bath Haas or Bath Haas however you want to pronounce it uh, and we know what the alpha of those is so they are going in so the idea is we're going to also ferment with Nottingham Ale yeast right then so moving on to the mash we're going to mash at 69 degrees centigrade for a full body and hopefully that accompanied with the extra chloride in the water will give us a nice rounded full bodied feel to the beer and uh, take or not take away not take away from the plum in any sense but if there's any acidic values left there you know any acidity or astringency hopefully this will help to ease that a little bit so uh, we're going to obviously make 40 litres of the beer your numbers here will be different and then on the session uh, it's saying that I'm going to hit 5.7 on the mash we'll see on the day I'd really not be too worried about 5.7 to be honest I could add a little bit of lactic acid if I needed to to bring that down to 5.2 but quite frankly uh, we'll play it by ear on the day uh, 5.6 ABV is the target mainly because uh, I'm unsure what the plum is going to give to us in the first instance so of course we don't want to have uh, a 5.6 percent beer and then the plum adds another percent and takes us up to 6.6 .6. so the base here without the plum addition will give us a 4.5 ABV and this plum will bump it up to 5.6 once the sugars in there finally ferment out and then when we go ahead to ferment we're just going to hold it at uh, 19 degrees centigrade or 18.5 actually uh, for the first day and uh, there we go we'll just have a play around 18.5 for primary secondary again we'll just probably hold it at 18.5 and that's actually when we're going to add the plum and then we'll cold crash it for the remainder down to 4 degrees see if we can get everything to drop out of solution so there we go that is it folks that is the plum porter designed after you can say has been some really insightful research so uh, we're going to wrap this one up and stay tuned where we will indeed be making this beer next week on the 20 gallon SS Brew Tech double tip brew stand god that's a mouthful said the maid to the vicar we'll see you tomorrow cheers